You're listening to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience, a podcast dedicated to helping executives train their sales and marketing teams to optimize growth. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. Let's accelerate your growth in three, two, one. Welcome everyone to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience. I'm Carlos Noche and I'm joined by my favorite podcast partner, Lisa Schneer. How are you, Lisa? I'm doing great today, Carlos. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm, you know, I'm feeling like this is going to be one of those fun podcast episodes. So pumped about this. Put one. on your hat. <laughs> um, <Give it> up. <laughs> <laughs> today we have a very special episode with a very amazing guest, and the topic is going about being the best possible you, no matter what your role is. So for this very special topic, which we're leaving a little vague because we want you to keep listening. We have Rob Hartnett, who is an award-winning sales and marketing leader, world champion sailor, author of the book, It's All Possible, and host of his own podcast called the It's All Possible Podcast. In his spare time, which I'm guessing is very limited based on this introduction, Rob is a uh, passionate cyclist and motorcyclist, plus he's from the land down under. Welcome, Rob. Hey, guys. How you doing? You well? Yeah, Carlos, That's you look right. Carlos looked like you look like you've been up all night, just like pulling an all nighter, or like you've been I you've been hanging never out with have Chad Sanderson too long. I don't know what it is. And Lisa, you look you. fresh, you look ready to go. So you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I was in workshops all day, so I feel like I've been up all night. <laughs> well, you know, I am coming to you from the future. You know That's that, right? Right. That's so, right. So tomorrow has and you're good. living it. <laughs> so you're ready to go for the future, Lisa. Carlos, you didn't need to worry so much. It's actually going to be all right. I, can you right. give me those lottery ticket numbers? <laughs> <laughs> I can, but they're only for local local taxation laws down here, so it just wouldn't be appropriate. Yeah, sorry about that. Fair enough, sorry. fair enough. <laughs> All right, Rob, we have our standard question we start every episode with to get to know the nitty-gritty about Rob. What is something that you're passionate about that those that primarily know you through work or business would be surprised to know about you? Well, that's an interesting one. I think... Um, Really, the passion, the passion for me has always been about personal growth. So that one's not so much. A lot of people know me through my sales career, my marketing career, management, leadership. Um, but, and, and personal growth certainly is a big part of that, and that's why we're here. But I really have had a passion for that since, uh, since I really entered the workforce. And so I've just devoured, uh, spent way too much money, or have I, but spent lots of money on courses and just really trying to work out how can you be the best you can be? What's the, what's the limit of your potential? Uh, and that really came to me from a, um, a, football, a football coach in Australia. I didn't work with him. He was unbelievable. He was at the elite level. But he always, he always had this great quote. And he actually said this to me. He said he, he coached so many great players. And he said, you know, it's not about how great they were. It's how great they could have been. And he saw so much wasted talent, right? And then he said, I saw other people who – really didn't have the innate skills, but just had the passion for it. And he said, those people were so much easier to train. And they went, they went above, like they, they, you heard that comment, they punching above our weight, right? They were, they were, they were really punching above their, their weight, what the expectations from anyone thought. And so I've always been fascinated with, you know, how far can you, you sort of push yourself or uh, what is the, what was the limited capability? So that's always been a passion of mine kind of in the background. That's really interesting. I had a, uh, I was a competitive horseback rider a million years ago, and I had a coach that said something similar. And it was that he would much rather coach people that aren't talented, that have a work ethic, because they've got to work for the skills uh, versus the people that are innately talented because they don't work for it. Yeah. And it was something along those lines. I'm butchering the quote, but, uh, but he was a Dutch guy. He was very good and he pushed you and you wanted to, you wanted to do the best you could. So I, you know, I totally buy into that. I I think that's it. And it's also, we all go about it in different ways, you know, that we go about it in different ways. I remember my, my son was, my oldest son was racing motocross at the time and he's a junior motocross rider. And his coach came up to me, a guy I know quite well now, um, still know really well. And uh, Glenn said, does Ben like to be like really encouraged and, and kind of pumped hard to go faster? Or is it kind of more just like to have a chat after afterwards? Because people are introverts, extroverts. And I would say, you know, Ben's pretty much an introvert, but he really liked the encouragement. And so uh, if he was coming over a jump and the idea when you jump a motorcycle is to get back on the gas as fast as you can, not to go like I do. Oh my God, I, I survived. <laughs> right. And it's like, you got to land and get the gas down. And so as soon as he'd land, Glenn would go, 
go Ben, go, 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 go. And Ben loved that. That was something that really motivated him. But that's but it can be different for somewhere else. Someone's going, like, what's the noise, man? Whereas other people can go, that's you know, fantastic and they're so motivated by it. So a lot of it is is it's very individual. And so we often read books, um, but you can read them and get ideas for sure. But at the end of the day, you need to actually come back to go, what works for you? What's the best thing for you? And that this really helps whether you're even people I find under stress. I see people under stress. Some need to be around other people and need to talk about all their problems on Facebook. That's just the way they are. Other people become really insular. Um, the same way that I can I can work really well in a super busy cafe, right? Because to me, it's the vibe, it's the energy. I bounce off that. I don't like, like other people I know go, hey man, I got to go away from you know get an Airbnb. I got to go away for three weeks and you know write my memoirs and just get into my own head and whatever. I'm like, good luck with that. That would kill me, right? But it's fantastic for someone else. So that's that's the other part of just learning that you're different and everyone's different. And so, but back to you, because uh, now you've had a wide range of experience in your career. You've done the large organization thing. You've done the successful startup thing and you've been on your own. So uh, plus all these amazing hobbies as which I'm just assuming you hate free time. So um, can, <laughs> could you actually uh, share some of the highlights of the journey and really like the story of what led you to where you are today? And uh, obviously the personal growth passion, but, uh, but yeah, tell us a little bit more about how you got here. Yeah. So I started in a small business and my, my father uh, ran a small business. He was a motor mechanic and engineer. He was very much into child labor. I started when I was five uh, in that business. <laughs> And uh, in, in fact, I, I really did. I mean, it was a small business. So as soon as like school was out, I had overalls. In fact, they actually had custom made small overalls made for me. I, I, I should have known there was something up to it when they didn't actually make them for other people uh, that I was being used up. But anyway, just kidding. Um, so I really started in that whole small business side, but it was a really interesting part, you know, growing up in small business when my father running, you know, basically biz B to C, we call it these days. He could only take two weeks off a year at Christmas time because the rest of it, if the business wasn't open, you didn't make money. And so I went, um, was kind of started all throughout, got to learn about business. My father was an engineer, still is an engineer. He's 93 years old. He's, uh, he's still going. He's still rebuilding motorcycles and still living at home and as fit as anything. Um, but, but he just, it was a really interesting, you know, people would come to him and go, you should really want to grow your business. You want to grow your business, John, you know, you should want to grow it. And he'd go, grow it. I hate the customers I've got. I don't want any more. Right. And that was so typical. I learned a lot about business owners, which come down to three people, you know, kind of the technicians, which my father was, um, they're kind of hobbyists, which kind of have a hobby that realize they need to make money. Uh, and then you get into the entrepreneurs who understand that they, you make more money from selling it than actually running it. So there's these three, but that actually led to one of my first books called small business, big opportunity, which I saw a lot of business owners like my father, <clears throat> but my father did a few things from a marketing perspective that were actually sheer gold albeit he didn't know it, which was he ran the one ad in the one newspaper on the same page for 30 years. And so he just nailed that page three in the local paper. And whenever it was a PR, he, you know, business got down a little bit in UPR because he was into racing cars, did a lot of racing cars and racing motorcycles before he got into kind of standard stuff. <laughs> Frankly, so he made more money out of standard cars than race cars. But the race cars attracted PR. And so he'd do PR about every month. He'd do a PR story on a particular car that was pretty unique. So I kind of learned a lot about business um, then. And, and as soon as I got old enough to understand what a customer was, he just had me dealing with them because he didn't want to. You know, it, we had sales reps coming in. Um, he would do the same thing. He'd go, don't talk to me, talk to Robert. And they go, where's Robert? And I just tap on their kneecaps and go, I'm down here. Because I was only about 10 at the time. But it was a great learning. And I learned a lot about some of the best salespeople. And I reflected on these people like 30 years later, reflected on some of our best sales reps that we had and how they worked and how good they were. Um, and I got in past all that. So I got into, um, I did a bit of, bit of a motorcycle racing for a little bit. Uh, but then I got into sailing and sailing was just a, a passion for mine. I found that um, I just really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the tactical part of it. I enjoyed the, uh, the skill side of it. And I also had a lot of people around my age that I was racing with at the time. So I got into that and just uh, that went right, right through to essentially winning a world championship um, a little bit later on and winning the numerous state titles and that kind of stuff. And I've also, I've sailed all sorts of different boats, which was, to me, really important to do to sell what we call offshore ocean racing boats to small racing dinghies. And I still do that um, uh, because it's, it's different skill set and you learn any boat you sail will give you good experience to be able to jump from boat to boat. And my, my idea of a great sailor was someone who could sail, go from different types of boats and, and be successful, you know, um, and that's what I've also seen through business as well. It, you should be able to go from a, a small business to a large business to a midsize. 
Uh, albeit it's a bit like sailing that if you start on the small stuff, you're a hell of a lot better in the big stuff. If you start in the big stuff, sometimes it's a real struggle on the small stuff. So and that's just, and then I really got into just going through a sales career. So I'm an accountant by profession, Lisa. So I'm a reformed accountant. Took a long time through AA, which is Accountants Anonymous, to uh, yeah. get weed myself off that. Um, but I did became an accountant. I love business and uh, went through that. And then I, I just was got an offer to um, to get into sales. Uh, really randomly, I was actually running treasury and taxation at about the age of 24 for craft in Australia. But I'd um, I, every place I'd been to, I, I'd sort of introduced Apple computers because I loved Apple computers. So I discovered them at KPMG. And the Apple guys said, hey, man, you know, you sell more Apple stuff than we do. Like every, we just follow you around to when you change jobs. You know, if it ever comes up, why don't you come and join us and sell these things full time? And, and I just got a little point where I was frustrated it, it, where I was. Um, yeah, just corporate life and you know how it's like. And I went, well, look, if I don't go now, like I'm, I'm single, not married, no kids, no mortgage, I'm just going to have a go at it. If, it. if I'm no good at it, I'll come back and be, be an accountant again. And so that led me off to um, pursuing a career in, in, uh, in sale, pure sales. So I was at a reseller, Apple reseller. And uh, literally I made Target second month in. Um, I only dealt with enterprise clients and we ended up going to be Oh, we were four times, four times in a row, Apple reseller of the year. Um, and nice. I won the biggest deal for, for Apple in Australia. It was the first million dollar deal for Apple corporate in Australia. We seen a single deal. And then I joined Apple itself. And that was uh, <clears throat> just wonderful. And I always loved them, still do. I uh, still have a huge passion for it. And from Apple led me to HP uh, to go to there. Had a corporate career through that and, and through a lot of machinations. Then started my own practice. Um, I, I worked in ad agencies, actually. I did, I did leave, left, after I left HP, did a couple of, did a start, a couple of startups, but I also worked in the advertising industry. So I wanted to work for a big global ad agency. You know, the reason why is they had the best parties. Nice to go to them as a client. And I thought, if I work there, maybe they're seven days a week. <laughs> Pretty much were. I was right. I was right. And that was just, I mean, I worked in one of the best creative agencies in Australia called Mojo. I came in there looking after direct and digital. They're owned by the publicist group you might have heard globally. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just, it was iconic. I learned so much working there. I learned about creativity. I learned the fact, which is really interesting for this economy, is that you can't cut cost to greatness. Yeah. Right. You cannot cost out to greatness. I don't care how many CEOs or MDs are listening to this and thinking that I'm just going to cut costs to greatness. Let me tell you, my friend, you are going backwards. The only way to do it is through creativity and through innovation. And you can't have creativity. You can't have innovation unless you have a psychologically safe environment, unless you have people who want to be there and feel they can fail. And that was the other part I, I, I saw as well that Failure was such an important part of growing up, you know, going higher in anything you do in life. And so, and then that led to me to, to looking at sales in a full-time profession. And so, um, kind of long story short, did about, uh, I think about 10 years um, with Miller Hyman Group uh, before they were bought out by Corn Ferry. And then I met you guys through Value Selling. And, and I've also done a lot of leadership stuff uh, with, uh, with John Maxwell. So I'm a member of the Maxwell Leadership Group. I got into that because as, you know, as you guys would have noticed, really, I found big change initiatives that I was involved with over 10 or 15 years uh, failed or were successful based on leadership. And so I became really interested in why, what, why were some leaders what they were? Could you teach leadership? How could you teach leadership? What was behind it? And, so it's, and that's still my ongoing passion at the moment is, is this whole area around leadership and, and coaching and, and getting companies to grow and helping people scale. Um, so that's where I'm at. I have a buddy of mine who does some sales coaching, but uh, he spun off, wrote a book on culture for the same reason, Rob. It's like, hey, if you don't have a culture that's willing to change and encourages a, a change in behaviors and allows people to you know, fail and succeed, then you're, you're, it doesn't matter what program you pick, it's going to fail because there's no support or foundation behind it. And I, I agree with you. After 16 years of being a, doing this, I talk about it every time. I mean, sometimes I just want to shake them. Hey, listen, um, at the end of the workshop, after they're telling me that it was the best thing they ever went through and they turn around, look you in the eye and ask you, hey, are we really doing this? If you're going to flinch, then let's just give up now. Well, you had surprised me. I, I, was, I was John Maxwell talked about this. They reckon in the Maxwell corporate group, so they're, they're, in their corporate, they, about 70% of clients they go and see about doing a leadership program or running leadership programs beyond communication, all the good stuff. The, the, the LT they'll be with will go, that'd be great. They'll be fantastic for our people. I'll really enjoy this. And, they, and then the, the, 
the actual guy was telling me, uh, he was telling me, for the, the, the rep was telling me, he said, I then stop and I go, now, hang on a second. So you guys aren't coming? No, no, no. This is for our other people. We're leaders. We already get it. And he goes, you know what? I don't think this is going to work out well for both of us. So maybe we'll just call it now. Because unless you're going to go through the leadership program with your other potential leaders and your high power potentials, kind of not a good look, you know? Yeah. <laughs> They're like, and they basically call it now. They said they've done it a few times and you just, you just give up. You go, your leaders aren't going to go through. But what's fascinating was John Maxwell made this quote when he first brought his book out on leadership. I think it was the 21, 21 Laws of, uh, of Leadership. Mm -hmm. I remember the book. Yeah. He ran this work, sort of seminars around it and he did these invites. No one turned up. No one turned up. He's like, what is going on? So he, he, kind of, he kind of rang around and said to his leaders and goes, I'm doing this thing, 21 Laws. And I go, yeah, yeah, man, great topic. Well, no, she didn't come. Well, I'm a leader. I don't need him. <laughs> I got I'm a leader. Book. He said, okay, no, I understand. Took the feedback, came back and changed the, changed the title of the book uh, and a change, changed the title of the book and changed the webinar to Influence. Sold out. <laughs> didn't change one bit of content in the book at all because at the end of the day, leadership is influence, isn't it, right? But he, so he said to these leaders, so what are you struggling with? Well, I'm really struggling to get my people to do anything. You know, as, as uh, I think John's got this great quote. He said, you know, if you're, if you're leading from the front, but no one's following, you're just taking a walk. Okay. You're taking a walk in the forest. No one's following you. And they're going, oh, I'm a leader, but no one's following me. And no one does what they said. I need influence. I don't need leadership. And he's like, yeah, okay. So we'll run influence for you. But sometimes you've got to change the narrative. And sometimes you've got to change what's the zeitgeist in the market right now. Your content's really good, but maybe the naming's not quite right. You know, but it is seriously about that. There's a lot of people in leadership positions not doing a whole lot of leading. They're not doing much managing either, by the way. So I'm kind of it's an interesting time we're in right now. I agree. In fact, we're going to circle back to that. So yeah. first off, love the book. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, that was awesome. And uh, one of the things that's funny in there is your range of stories. You know, a lot of times in a book, it's all, you know, sales leader stories or they're all sports stories. You got right. sports, you got PhDs across different professions, movie makers. I'm like, yeah. my God, I think he knows everyone in Australia and around the globe. <laughs> so it, it made it really interesting. Oh, and thank I, you. I think yeah. it's an awesome book. So where do we start? Well, you know, the book is about it's all possible. So we thought about the podcast being about, you know, being the best possible you. What might be some common attributes? Maybe we start there that you've seen that, you know, some of the, you know, best people out there that are able to, you know, excel, you know, get to a higher level. And because it's not always talent. <laughs> it's very little, um, little, little bit of talent. In fact, well, probably I think a good place to start is some newer research, which I've been doing post the book. So the book, the book is still super valuable and it's in there, but you know, as you do a book, you're writing, you keep learning more. And, and I kept learning more and there were parts of it that jumped out and it's feedback like you, Carlos, gave me that idea. And one of the areas in there was a book called, it was an was a acronym in there called Champion, the Champion Process. The Champion Process resonated with a lot of people. Um, that one resonated a lot. And so I really got into that. And I started building um, sort of my next book around expanding on the Champion Process. And then I got into the Champion Process, um, which is around how you execute on the strategy. I then went back and said, hang on, I still came across people struggling with the vision. Like, how do we know where we want to go? And the reality is if our attitude and mindset is small, we'll only have small ideas. And Lisa and Carlos, the world doesn't need your small little ideas. It wants your big idea. It wants what you think you can do best. And so we want big ideas. Well, how do you do that? So I came up with what I call a three R strategy. And that's because, and the three R is this, reimagine possibility, remove obstacles, release potential. And as I came up through this, I realized I'd actually used the three R in everything I'd done successfully. I just hadn't dawned on me. Even after I wrote the book, I didn't come back to three R. And so reimagining possibility is really thinking really big because you got you to put fact, you got to suspend facts. You got to suspend history because it says, well, we always did it that way. We've only ever achieved that. You know, when I, when I came to Miller Hyman, and they said to me in Australia, no one has ever sold, this is the top gurus at the time, no one's ever sold more than a million dollars of Miller Hyman in Australia in any one year. No one's ever done it. We're a little Australia over here. It's North America is where it's at, blah, 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 blah. You listen to all that. Year two, I did 5.5 million, right? Now, that was interesting. It's not about me, but guess what happened after that? 
Guess how many people did a million dollars after that, right? About six who'd never done it beforehand. And it's the same thing. Whenever someone beats, you know, like the, the 100 meter sprint, like go under a certain percentage or a certain time, next thing, the record gets broken like five times in the next six months because people believe at that point. Isn't that the, the banister thing does it though? First. Four minute mile. Exactly. Guy? It's the banister. Exactly. It happens in every sporting event. At least you would have seen it in stuff you would have done. Someone would have said, you can't do that with a horse. You can't. Do that. Someone does and they go, oh, really? And all of a sudden, everybody's doing it, right? You see it with uh, in X Games, you know, as Travis Pastrana does something that's a, you know, a triple backflip, but all of a sudden, oh my God, Travis, it's amazing. Next thing is five other guys doing it, right? Because they suddenly can see it. And, and that's the trick with people is having the vision. So the 3R model became um, really important. And the really important part of this is you never get possibility without obstacles. The possibility journey is impossible without the obstacles. You will get the obstacles. Uh, and that might, that's, sometimes that's what stops people. But my third R was one I've always found really interesting, releasing potential. There is always potential in every one of us, or if you're a leader in your team, there is great potential. And we just haven't, we haven't released it. We haven't found out who that person is. We haven't delegated. I see, I see often see leaders take on too much stuff, right? And they do stuff. You go, do you, do you like all the stuff you do? No, I hate that shit. Well, go not you give it to someone who will actually love it, right? Have you ever watched that ever TV show, Brooklyn Nine-Nine? Love that show. Right, love it yeah. show. Right, so Brooklyn it's Nine Nine great. is the absolute perfect part of when you know, you know, when, when Raymond Holt. Mate, I love Raymond Holt so much. Um, the great Andre Brower, late Andre Brower, who would you know he'd, he'd have anything. He was such a great leader. He'd have anything like really deep, deep data work to do. Uh, Amy, because <laughs> like Amy Santiago was like, oh my god, can I bind something? Right, and it was a crazy off the wall idea. Jake, I need you to go and do this. It's such a great model, and he just used the people. It, what they loved and were really good at. And so that's the, that's releasing potential. So it's a three hours. So reimagine, remove, and then release. But the reimagine is, is just thinking, what really could I do given not what I have right now, but where could I do it? And I also use a concept um, called who, not how. You may have heard about that, which is who, not how is, is don't think about how you do it. Who could help you do it? Who could help you? Classic example, right? I'm, I'm, I'm renovating a sort of a, kind of a muscle car at the moment, right? And it's kind of fun. I'm really enjoying it. I'm getting into it. I'm really having a lot of fun. But there's a lot of stuff I find. I go, what the freak is going on here? And because it's about 50 years old, it's had a lot of things done to it over time, right? But I, now I don't go and sit under the car and try and figure it out. I literally get in my car. I drive five kilometers and I see Brian. And Brian owns this great wrecking yard. And he's been working on these cars for 50 years. I go, Brian, what's this part here? And do you reckon they should have done that with that? And he goes, ah, oh, let me tell you. This is what you did over here. That's when they changed the model for that. Who, not how. I could sit there for hours trying to figure it out, reading books, getting on Google. I go, see, Brian, he's got the wealth of knowledge. And so that's what a lot of people don't do is think about the who, not how. Because the who people think differently, act differently, and they'll show you a way that you just couldn't get to because you just got the fog. So there are but so reimagining possibility is a, is a really big one. And especially if you're leading a team, it's a challenge. You, know, you can do it yourself. You can have a great idea, right? Because I remember when I was at HP, they were their HP PCs in Australia were running about number 14 in market share. And I'd come from Apple. I didn't even know there was more than four. I didn't know we could go to 14, right? I said, we're at 14. Is that a mistake? I had this one like beside the four. Can we remove that with like liquid paper? And they go, no, no, we're 14. They're almost proud. And I'm like, 14? We're 14? And they go, why are you so angry at us? We were 17 last year. <laughs> okay, 17? Jeez, I haven't got lower than fourth. Uh, and I said to them, we, we can do this. We can go, we can get to number one in maybe three or four years if we can do this. And, and that was easy for me to see because I'd been there, right? They hadn't been. And if a team can't see it, you've got to meet them where they're at. You've got to come back to them. There's no point barreling on. I had to come back to them, understand and praise the fact they'd gone from 17 to 14. Understood how they went from 17 to 14 because that was a good thing. They could improve. What could we do from there? So take them on the journey. And that means a lot of communication. And you actually, as a leader, you sound like a broken record. It's the same message over and over and over again. And then the strategy is going to come off the back of it. And, and reality was, there was a very much who, not how around we, the team that was put together around that was just awesome. Uh, and we did actually get to number one. We did it in actually 18 months. Uh, just wow. for a few circumstances falling in our falling in our lap, luck is a big part as well too. Don't discount luck. Um, so I think that's that. They're the three R's with were probably the bigger ones I had. And to answer your question, Carlos, really, what if I looked at what I call people of possibility, 
And I call them pop stars, right? So POP, people of possibility who are stars of their life, right? So pop stars. If I look at people like that, they're, and I did, this is what I've done probably the last 18 months on, is really focused on those people. What do they do differently? And there's six things I've come down to what they do differently. The first one is they think really big. So that's the visualization thing. They think big, right? Are they going to do anything? Are they going to think at all? They think big, right? They go, you might as well think, I might as well think big. So they think big. Second thing they are is insanely curious. They have no ego. They, they just they're passionate about something. They want to know how it works. They're insanely curious. The third thing they do is they take massive action on the curiosity. So not just have the information and go, well, it was interesting. They actually take massive action. Fourth thing is they're process orientated. They have a lot of process. So this is, this is interesting for people because people don't think they do. Just, they're just good at it. No, they have a process for the skill. They have a process for how they learn. They have a process to how they implement. Four, uh, fifthly, they're grateful and optimistic. And I think that's really important. So they're grateful for where they've been, grateful for where they are. They're optimistic about the future. They're not blind optimism, but they're, they're optimistic. And the last one is they have fun. And when the fun stops, they stop doing it. So those six, if you think about those six, they're actually what we all have as little kids. We think big, right? Grateful, we're optimistic about the future. We definitely have a lot of fun. Right? We're asking questions, we're curious all the time. We may not take as much action when we're little kids because we can't sometimes, but generally it's actually had to remain, it's actually had to remain useful if you think those six things. And nearly we what separates people. Most obvious one to, to globally is Arnold Schwarzenegger when you look at this. So Arnold going from his father saying to him in Austria, if you can just become a policeman locally, that'll be a job well done for you. And him going, maybe, maybe, maybe not. And doing the whole bodybuilder thing and being chastised by his local community and his parents for doing it and being self-centered and blah, 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 blah. Going through that, becoming what he became, then going to the US, not speaking any English, getting over there, winning Mr. Universe, but not the first time. It's a really interesting story. He actually lost. Um, he lost the first time. He, he did it. And he said he lost this kind of what he thought was a pretty scrawny guy, but he realized he lost because he wasn't cut the right way because he wasn't training the way that the world champions uh, were actually analyzed. So what did Arnold do? He made great friends with the guy who won and said to him, I'm living in Venice. I got a really small apartment, but I would love it if you would come and live with me for six months and we train together. That's how you get good. And the guy did. The guy came down and they trained because Arnold said, I couldn't just get stuff over the phone. I needed to watch him every day. And I had him train me and they're still great friends. But then Arnold, he got, he, he, the, the fun went out of the bodybuilding for him. So he thought, what do I do next? Acting. Everyone told me, no, I'll have a go. Same process. Think big. What could I do? We all know how well he did with that. He, the fun went out of acting for him and he wanted to give back. Politics became the next side of things, right? And there was an up and down career through that, but he still achieved it. When that got too tough, the fun went out of that. He's now into climate change. That's kind of his big mantra at the moment around climate change. So he's probably the most example. The other big example is probably Selena Gomez is a great example of all this. Um, and, you know, recently she said, I've probably got one album left in me because I just don't enjoy it as much. I love acting. I'm loving I'm doing this thing, you know, she's doing with um, on Netflix I think, at the moment. And she's loving that. She said, I'm really enjoying that, that show. But, um, I, yeah, I, the fun's kind of gone out of the music. I love it every so often, but this is where I want to focus on. And if you look at her career, it's, it hits every one of those six as well. Very process orientated. Someone said to her, um, it was a podcast, I was listening to her on Smartless. And they said, hey, is it too early in the morning for you? It's like a 7 a.m. call. And she goes, she says, are you kidding me? When you're a Disney kid, you understand process. At 7.15, the limo pulls up outside and you go to work. And Disney teaches you to sing, to dance, to do media, to act. You don't have much of a childhood, she said, but you definitely have <laughs> a process and a rigor that sets you up for the rest of your life. And so I think that's, they're kind of the six things that every one of us can do anywhere in the world at any time in our own way. It doesn't, you don't have to become those people. I only use them as examples because they're people most people recognize. But all of us will know people in our life. And I know you guys, you, know, you guys do so much of that yourselves. But, you know, Lisa and Carlos, I know you hit so many of that six in, the, in your own way and the way that you do things as well. That's amazing, Rob. And so I got to ask because, like, Again, through this process, you got the opportunity to dig into a lot of different types of professionals' lives from like very different industries. So 
Do you have a couple that were favorites that were really motivational or inspirational to you that's really stood out um, because of their, not necessarily their industry, but because of their story or their process? Yeah, I think probably the, 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 there was one particular leader someone asked me about, uh, I was on a leadership podcast and they had that, they're trying to ask me about bad leaders. And I know, frankly, I haven't had that many bad leaders. I've, I've definitely had some, right? But I've actually had more good leaders. And maybe it's just the way I'm optimistic and think about it. But I remember one in particular it was a guy called Kim Hamilton. He's retired now. He was at HP. But he brought me into HP. Um, and he got brought in himself. He'd come from Toshiba. And he came in and looked around. And HP in Australia at the time was, you know, people were there forever. It was, people just didn't leave. It was a great place. You honestly didn't leave. Problem was they had groupthink and okay. they least realized themselves that they had so much groupthink going in there, they couldn't think outside the box. And so they brought Kim in from Toshiba to kind of rev up the marketing group. And Kim came in and realized very quickly, oh, I'm going to need some soldiers here. <laughs> this isn't going to be on. And so he recruited me from Apple. He recruited another friend of mine from Packard Bell, if you remember that brand. Um, another one came from one of the, the airlines. And so he recruited probably six of us who came in at what we call market development roles. Um, and what was really interesting about HP is that sales reported into marketing, right? Uh, so because marketing- sales would, would work out into into marketing. marketing. Yeah, so big deal sign-offs were done by me as, as marketing development manager of PCs. The sales leader had a certain amount of autonomy and one of the release potentials leads where I did was give them more autonomy. But it actually reported, it made sense because when you're going to do a product, you've got to market it. Are you going to go direct? Are you going through channel? Are you going online, right? So you should work that out. That actually is the responsibility of the marketer. It was also the only place I've come across where the marketing team were on upside and downside. So we were on, we were on the same, essentially very similar comm plans, SIP plans to the sales team. Uh, let me tell you, that's how you get buy-in. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> That's how you get buy-in, people. A very smart organization. So, and then the whole chairman, president of HP at the time was Lou Platt. And uh, I had a huge admiration for Lou. Uh, I got to meet him a couple of times um, and connect with him and his ability to connect with 145,000 people around the world and literally do that. And uh, was just, I thought he was so impressive. I thought he was so impressive as a leader to get that communication going, to have that motivation. And then back to Kim, Kim's ability to go, you know, what? I need different people here. We're going to change the game up. So his ability to, to actually uh, influence, his, to influence his peers, to influence up to his stakeholders and his bosses and to influence downwards. Very rare. You get someone who's really good at influencing across, up and down. Uh, and Kim was able to do that. And we came in and HP was, a, I remember we were going to HP, it had a, a sea of company cars, right? It was, it was HP blue, everyone bled blue. And uh, it, was, it was a sea of all these company like Fords and, and, and Holdens and things like that, uh, which is the Australian brand uh, for, for General Motors. Um, sea of them. And then you know, Kim had his Saab and at the time, I'd come from Apple. We were all driving 911 Porsches. So I rocked, I rocked up in my 911 Porsche with this massive exhaust system. I set off six car alarms, I think, when I turned up. And there was this massive for all. All this back work was going on. I heard sidebar conversations. Who was this Rob Hartnett guy? And I had to, went to Kim going, what are you paying these people? There's a guy rocked up here in a 911 Porsche, right? Uh, and he, and, and Kim's, I remember forget Kim's response. He told me afterwards, cause it was raised up in an LT meeting that what was Kim doing? And Kim said, oh, 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 you mean Rob Hartley, the new guy's come from Apple. He's, he's got that, that red colored Porsche. They go, yeah, what's going on? Kim goes, oh, we're all getting them. Yeah, no, he's the first, but we're all getting them. And after they kind of realized he was joking, he goes, can we just get back to business? Now let me run my team and you'll run yours. Uh, and it was so cool and, and literally it's kind of what happened, but there was, um, he was a great leader because he was, he was happy to break the mold. He was happy to do things differently and he, was, he allowed you to fail. And I did so many uh, innovative ideas. Thank God more came off than didn't, but some didn't, uh, but, but he allowed you to fail and learn. And I think any leader he can do that is fantastic. And Lou Platt similarly as well, didn't, you know, we, to get the PC business to where we got it to, we needed to build a factory in Australia. <laughs> And that's not an easy thing to do. I can't do that on the weekend, right? And so I needed to go literally to the board uh, through various leaders. And, and Lou came down and, and opened the factory with his wife. And it was just, a, it was a great experience. And I, I really kudos to him to fly so far away from where his head office was. I'm sure he had more things uh, on his plate than to get down here to open the office. But it was important uh, for them to do that. So that's just a couple, Lisa. You know, it's uh, interesting. A couple of times you said, you know, he let us, you know, look, you know having leaders that allow you to fail. And uh, Sarah Blakely, who invented Spanx and is a billionaire, she, she's got this masterclass. And 
there's a line in there and it, it just rings in my head. She goes, one of the, the greatest gifts her father gave her was uh, he had her try new things every day and fail at them. And, you know, just yeah. that it's okay to fail. It's okay to try Absolutely. things and, and not, and, you know, not succeed at it and not be great, but it's not okay not to try. So I know it's yeah. just rung in my head in that story. And as you talk about it, it gets her. All right, here's my question. At the core of your book, one of the things in, it's, it's important to the approach is attitude and mindset. And, you know, me and Lisa talk about mindset being critical in sales all the time. But what advice would you have for our listeners that might find themselves trapped in a position or worse yet, feeling burnt out in the position that they're in? You know, sometimes it's easy to say, you know, you got to have a mindset of growth. But sometimes it's hard to you know to find it in yourself. Any advice there? Hundred percent. Yeah. So look, a lot of that is the champion process. So I'll just run that through what it is, because uh, you'll love it. So the, the C for champion is chunk it down, and that's one of the most important things. Chunk it down. And I am terrible about this, uh, and I've got to learn. I'm, I'm I'm learning. You know, this book. Don't talk about research. Look at this book as me search. Right. <laughs> right. This book is about me, and I, and I keep making mistakes. Chunk things down when you have a big target or a big area where you've got to go to, chunk it down. The brain loves it. Luckily, I've done a bit of work in neuroscience the last few years. But chunk it down, right? Chunk it down to small, manageable steps, right? Even if something's overwhelming. I tell you this from someone who put themselves in the hospital last year with hypertension because they were imagining all possible crazy outcomes that could happen to the point that I was hospitalized. Now, that's just, I learned about myself. It's actually one of my Gallup strengths, believe it or not, is the ability to imagine a whole lot of different options, which is a good thing on one side, can be a really bad one on the other side. And I learned the dark side last year. Um, so chunk it down, right? Um, the, 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 the H is have a go, right? Once you've chunked it down, have a go. You know, pay, take the first step to your, you know, to your impossible, right? That's what I always say. Take the first possible step to your impossible. So have a go at something. The A is for assess results. Are you on track, off track? Did it work? Did it not work, right? But the M is where the, your question came from. That's mental fitness, right? We talk about mental health. Mental health is basically got a bad name. It's like mental, we got mental health issues. Mental fitness means, hey, you know what? Mental fitness? You mean I can get better? Shit, yeah. Just like physically you can go to the gym. Mental fitness says you can get better every day. What do I have to do for mental fitness? It might be I'm doing visioning, uh, you know, imagination, uh, visualizing. It might be affirmations. I mean, at least the stuff you're doing is awesome. It's exactly what that is. It's the M, right? So a lot of stuff you do. And, 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 people, and if you're listening on this podcast, you're not checking out Lisa's stuff on LinkedIn, you go check it out. She has some great stuff on that. I got to so keep that's, it up. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah, you got to do it. We have Pressure to, you have to do it you're good at, because you're good at it. Um, but that's, that's my work called mindset maintenance or mental fitness is the, is the M. All right, so that's the important part is every time we're going to have bad days, we're going to sink down. We're going to, we, we're going to have negative thought. Uh, in the book, you would have seen the stats in there, which I used around, you know, the 60, 60, 90, 80, which is we have 60,000 thoughts a day. 90% of are the same ones we had yesterday, the day before that. That's why addiction is hard to get rid of. And 80% of our thoughts are negative. That's where we come from. It's how the brain is wired. It's our reptilian brain. So when you have a negative thought first off, it's pretty natural. Don't beat yourself up. You know, as I say, you know, kind of be kind to yourself, right? Be kind to yourself. Because you will have that negative one. And that's just the brain protecting you. It goes, hey, this, this, this could happen. Right? And, I, and one of the things that's really helpful for that, and in the book, I talk about it, the three voices that you can have in your head. And I label those three voices now because it's just easier to tell what voice is, is talking to me. Right? And so then, so the, the P for champion is people. Hang around with the right people. People are really important. That group you're with. Are you hanging around with the right group or the wrong group? A group that takes you down or a group that takes you up? And if you're related to them, you still got to walk away, people, right? And you will get that as well. And the I is investigate world class. And I think that's more, I don't think it's a, a North American thing specifically, but in Australia, we, we tend to just look locally, whereas I say, you can do anything. And you would have seen Australia got like fourth in, in, in the gold medal tally in the Olympics, right? We're tiny, tiny little country, like 25 million people totally here. It just shows you what you can do. So investigate world class. What's the world's best doing? The O is for own the outcome, uh, and that's good or bad. What we tend to do is own the outcome when we suck, right? But we never celebrate when we win. We should celebrate when we win. Australians are terrible at that, more, way, more, way worse than Americans. Americans are actually really good at this. We, should, we look to you for, for how to do that. Um, but you should celebrate the win as much as – take the, so take the, take the responsibility for the win as well as when you, you fail and learn from that. And the N is for never give up. 
if you believe in it, keep going in it. And my, my famous story back to a question you asked Lisa about people in this area, my favorite story is actually Prince, the uh, musician and Prince's story. And you know, the, the song, um, you know, 1999, everyone knows 1999. The reason everybody knows 1999 is Prince released it no less than five times because he loved that song and he just didn't feel it was getting enough traction. He released it over the years five times independently. You know, the reason he did the movie Purple Rain was not because he wanted to do a movie. It was because he realized that movies had soundtracks. And if he did a soundtrack, that would actually get more of his music out to more people. I and mean, he was fascinating to watch how much he believed in certain songs or in certain people and just kept on going, kept on going, kept on going until everyone heard it. It's a bit like Airbnb was launched three times. I don't know if you know that, but Airbnb, Brian Chesky said, we launched it three times. And his, his, his marketing team came to him on the second, second time going, Brian, we kind of launched twice already. Do you think we should go a third time? He goes, well, no one knew, so let's keep going. <laughs> it's, it's a great point. You just Sometimes you just got to believe in yourself and keep going. So Champion does that. And if we are down, it's get with the right people. Take some time out for yourself, but read the stuff. Reimagine your, your possibility. Reimagine what's possible for you. You know, and set those gates and go, how do, what, what's the first thing I can do to get there? You don't have to do the whole big thing. You don't have to talk about it on social media, you know, just go and do it. I find people also, the other thing they, they people fall into is really finding their purpose, right? What's my purpose? And they're obsessing on their purpose. Well, your purpose evolves, right? It was Dwayne The Rock Johnson who, who said it really well. He said, my purpose when I, was, when I was poor and didn't have a job was get a job. That was my purpose. He said, my second purpose was feed my family. My, you know, my third purpose was, you know, get in the ring. And he said, my purposes have evolved. I have never been the same one. They've been really important. And once he's worked out what they are, he hones down on them. But the purposes evolve. And people go, it's too hard on themselves trying to find their ultimate purpose in life. Well, you've got to take action. Action precedes passion. You can't get passionate about something you haven't done. You can't go, oh, I think I'd, I think I'd be a passionate leader. Really? Go and try it, right? Act first, then go. Then you actually, the passion will come through from that. Yeah, I love that. A couple of things there that you said resonated. In, and uh, one, of, one of my favorite quotes that I used to have on the board behind me all the time is action beats anxiety. So similarly, I, I like how you tie it to passion. Like, what can you be passionate about if you've never tried it? And which all ties back to your, you know, you're you might fail if you try but you're doomed if you don't and so like it it does come with uh come with that and then something you were saying like when you're talking about the thoughts and how repetitive our brains are i saw this the other day and i can't even remember the hole i went down to find it so i can't uh, give the credit to any source but it was um something like we create the patterns so the patterns don't create us so yeah. When you think about yes. that, it's like if you just let the patterns create you, you're in that negative space. You're going to think the same thing every day. You got you create the patterns, which gives you back the control. Um, and I think that, that that goes into what you're saying about mental fitness is like it's not easy to do that. You've got to break the pattern in order to make the pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're, now we're just That's rhyming. the process part. <laughs> Well, I think the other thing, it, it ties a little bit back. Your quote actually tied right back to Carlos's talk point on leadership and for many culture, right? And so one of the things I've learned about culture is a great quote I was given. And the quote is this, that culture is just shared everyday habits. It's nice. shared everyday habits. It's the little things. It's, you know, every organization has culture. You, Carlos, Lisa, you and I, we, we've walked into organizations and you can tell the culture straight away. Oh, yeah. Because it's shared everyday habits, right? It's the little things that make up the culture. Everyone's got a culture. It might suck. It's still a culture or it might be unbelievably great. And we see it and we pick it up in an instant. Now we're maybe a little more wired than people to do that, but it's there. And, and it really is what are the shared everyday habits we have that build us to be a culture? If it's walking past stuff, it's not great. If it's tolerating sexism, if it's tolerating, you know, a non-diverse type of comments and we go, that's okay. Yeah, they'll get over it. No, they won't get over it. And that was inappropriate. And you've now just condoned what is normal. You just normalized bad behavior. That's the biggest challenge. And so it's that stuff, those shared everyday habits. Do we want that to become a habit or are we going to nip it in the bud right now? Um, so I think they're the, that's what a culture essentially is, is shared everyday habits, whether they're good or whether they're bad. So I feel like we could turn this into a series of podcasts, <laughs> so, but <laughs> you've got yeah. such, gra such right. great, great actionable advice in here, Rob, but we've got to start our wrap up process. And one of the questions we like to ask people, especially in your position and positions that you've held throughout the years is, yes, you've been the salesperson a lot of the time, but you get sold to 
all the time. So a lot of our listeners are in that position where they're trying to capture some the attention of someone like you. So when you think about the creative ways that someone has prospected to you uh, without an introduction, without that warm referral, they're cold prospecting and they and you actually go, huh, I'm going to reply to that. Do you have any uh, advice for the listeners? Yeah, I'm pretty easy to work out. So I'm a DI style if you've done anything in DISC. So I'm 50% D, 50% I. Um, so for me, uh, and it's what I tell people when you're trying to sell to D's like me, it's just three things, right? Be brief, be brilliant and be gone. Right. That's pretty much it. Because if you're, if you're onto the point, it's a bit like, you know, what, what, you know, what, who, and what's next, what are you telling me about? Startle me, give me something new or interesting I didn't know about. Uh, and then, and then get out of the way. Cause then I got to do something with it and I'll come back to you. So from that perspective, yeah, it's um, that's 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 for me now. Now, if you're selling to my wife, very very different. She and I are 180 degrees different. You need to take the time, talk through things, give her the detail, let her ponder on it. So like it's really interesting when people are selling to both of us. <laughs> it's kind of fun. So again, it's yeah, that's free for me. For me, it's very much working out the style of the people you person you're going to be to to uh, identify with and communicate to and you can pick that up as you're going through the conversation and so a lot of it's about listening really more than anything i think it's the listening to pick up cues when you're selling to them I, one of my clients is actually very similar style to me she is right on the disc profile almost a dot apart and she said to me the other day she had a call from a SaaS company talking to her i'd actually referred the SaaS company in which is not great and uh, they're normally good but and i said well how did it go and she said well it was a pretty good meeting first off. And then I said, well, why don't you use us as a case study? And then second time, when you come back to see us again, just show us how you profile us and da, 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 da. They came back the second time. They didn't listen to one thing she said. Didn't listen to one thing she said. And she said, and she told me, she goes, you know what? They didn't profile us. They didn't showcase us. I literally told them how to do it. She said, I was trying to coach them through the sale because I really, she said, I really want this. But the, the rest of her team, the rest of her division have gone, we're not doing it. So these guys have blown a major, major opportunity simply because they didn't listen. You don't have to be Einstein. You just had to listen and do exactly what she suggested for the second meeting. So I find that is that people can listen and not just turn up and just do the old, uh, you know, show up and throw up. That I don't like. Um, but if they take, they can connect with me on a personal basis, that's great. If they know somebody who knows me, that's a really big one for me. I always think that's the, that's one of the best ways of credibility and not someone who's like a second or third connection on LinkedIn. I'm talking about, you know, somebody who knows me or, you know, someone who I work with somebody over there. So referred in is, is ultimately uh, not only for me, I think, but I think for most people, a great way to start a conversation off. It creates some uh, instant trust or at least the illusion of some. And it's, uh, it's well, funny. It, it creates referred trust, Carlos. I mean, you still have to earn it when you're in the room, but I'll tell you what, referred trust is better than no trust. So it's a, it's a good place to start. Yeah. The lack of listening. It's funny because people have, do you teach sales to buyers? I go, I don't, but you might be onto something. But the times I actually sit down with buyers and you talk about what's your experience with sellers, I will tell you eight times out of 10, they don't listen. That is the common thread I hear all the time. Your story is exactly the same story I heard 10 years ago from some reps at VMware. Right. Uh, like we wanted the software, we were promoting it. We actually told them, do this. This is what we need you to right. do in the next meeting. They showed up with the same tired pitch and it went nowhere. So all right, I got off my hobby horse. Last question, we call it Acceleration Insights. What might be that one piece of advice, be it business or personal, that you would share with our listeners so they could possibly have as successful a career as you have? One piece of advice, the piece of advice I'd say is, I think probably three things. One is once you've, once you've, you've locked in what you're good at and where you want to go, is then to go, how do I get really good at it? Second, is the second thing. So how do I get really good at it? So I lock it in. So don't get lazy, right? So once you're good at something or you, you find you're going towards you, you're on your direction to where you're going to go. How do I get really good at it? How do I get world-class at it? And then thirdly, how do I teach it to others? How can I bring others on the journey with me? Because if you bring others on the journey with you, it's so much more fun to do. And it's actually more motivating than just doing it on your own. And you're really sharing a gift that, that you have. And, and a lot of people don't do that. They do the gift for themselves, but they don't think about how they could share that gift or bring others along. And if you can bring others along uh, and do it with empathy and do it with kindness and do it with love, this whole planet will be a lot better place. 
Okay, hundred percent agree. I did an affirmation kind of around that. So that's great advice, Rob. Uh, so Rob, a couple of things. Um, podcast is on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Apple, yeah, and Amazon. I think we're on Rob most of the podcast platforms. Okay, and then the book. Uh, so the the most recent book is Amazon. And... It's on, yeah. So yeah, on Amazon, uh, Amazon. Any of the books, major bookstores have got it. Uh, and the thing you might not know is that just recently, it's actually a little short LinkedIn learning course now. So Blinkers have put it up on uh, LinkedIn learning. So you can, it's like there's condensed it down to 18 minutes and they did the recording and put it all up there. So big kudos to Blinkers and thanks for doing that. And for LinkedIn learning, you've got it there as well. So you get a bit of a taste of what the book's about just in those, uh, in a little short course. And you get a certificate. How good is that? I love it, right? We love the certificates. Yay. Uh, perfect. And then so if anybody who's listening wanted to engage with you, what's your preferred method of communication or, or contact? It's a three LinkedIn. So pretty easy to find on LinkedIn. Uh, or just if you do, uh, if you go to my website, which is robhartnett, robhartnett.com. Perfect. And we'll link to those in the comments. So Rob, cannot thank you enough for taking the time to join us today, especially with the, uh, the huge riff in time zones. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you guys. It was absolutely awesome. And uh, yeah, have a great, have a great. And it's going to be, remember, the future is fantastic. I'm already here. All right. So, you know, look forward to it. All right. See you next time. Exactly. Thanks, exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. That does it for this episode. Please check us out at www.b2brevexec.com. Share this episode with your friends, your family, your dogs, your kids. And if you like what you hear, please uh, subscribe through YouTube, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. And you can throw us a five-star review on iTunes. And I am Lisa Schneer. I'm joined by my ever-interesting podcast partner, Carlos Noche, even when he's on very minimal sleep. And until next time, we wish you nothing but the greatest success. You've been listening to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.